Hello, faith community, and welcome to Reading Through the New Testament in a Year. We find ourselves beginning today the Gospel of John. Now, the Gospel of John is the fourth and final gospel. It has the latest date. It was probably written um, after 70 AD. It's written by John. Most likely, many of the apostles at this point have been martyred. Um, and, and John is writing most likely to a, a Gentile audience. You can see as he writes the Gospel of John that he explains things, he explains Jewish customs. Um, we also see that he's most concerned with proving the deity of Christ and proving that Christ is the Messiah. And that's actually what the word Christ means. It's just the Greek word for Messiah. The central theme is John 20, 31, where it says, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that's the Messiah, the Son of God. His deity is tied up with his sonship. And, and then he says this, and that by believing you might have life in his name. This is what John is concerned with, that we understand who Jesus is so we can believe in him. And that belief in the gospel of John, that's that abject dependence. It's depending on him solely for our salvation and for our sanctification. Let's go ahead and get into chapter 1. So John begins, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that had been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Now, what John is doing here, he's introducing the characters of his gospel, and the most important character, the focus of his gospel is Jesus. And he begins with this title, Word. He describes Jesus as the Word. So the first character he wants to introduce is his central character, the Word. And, and who is this? This is Jesus Christ. Why is Jesus Christ referred to as the Word? It's because he's the incarnation. He's the Word made flesh. He's the incarnation of God's perfect Word. Everything God has spoken, everything that comes out of God's lips is perfect perfect. Creation is perfect when God creates it. God's word is perfect, and Jesus is the word. He's the full incarnation of everything that God has spoken. Now, Jesus is not just described as the word. He also says that it's by the word that everything is created. Jesus is the creator. And not only that, what's it say in verse 1? And the word was God. Jesus is God. Right there from the very beginning, John wants us to understand that Jesus is God. Then he says this, Jesus is life. Jesus is life. There can be no life apart from Jesus Christ. It's God who breathed life into man. It's God who gave life to every created being. Jesus is that life. And then what does he say about that life? He says that life is the light of man. Jesus' life was a light shining in a dark place. When Jesus came and he walked upon the world, everybody noticed his life was different. It was in a stark contrast to the darkness that had descended upon those fallen walking upon the face of the earth. And what does it say? The darkness has not overcome it. What that means is light beats darkness every time. Light overcomes darkness every single time. This is Jesus. Later on in chapter 1, in verse 14, he, be, he returns to this theme of the Word, and he tells us more about it. He says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John wants us to not only know that Jesus is the Word of God, he wants us to know we were eyewitnesses. We observed this glorious light. We observe the grace and truth that Jesus manifests, the one who came from the Father, the one and only Son from the Father. 
In verse 18, he explains this, No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. Right, you'll, you'll remember later on, um, Philip asks Jesus to show them the Father. And Jesus says, I've been with you so long. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To see Jesus is to see the Father. Jesus is God. This is, this is John's central theme, and he's going to hammer on it throughout the Gospel of John. You can't miss it. Jesus is himself God. John 1.18. You can't argue with that. The second character that John introduces here is the witness to the light. And the witness to the light is this forerunner, the one who goes in front of the Christ. This is John the Baptist, okay? Not John the Apostle who's writing um, the gospel, but it's John the Baptist. And he comes as a forerunner to Christ. And he does two things. He's preparing the way for the light, and he's pointing people towards the light, so, so he's, he's making people ready to receive the light, but then also he's pointing them towards it. We see him doing this throughout um, his ministry here. So there's a couple things he says to testify to Jesus. John 1.15, John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. John is pointing out, it's not about me, guys. Don't get excited about me. There's one who existed before me. Now, even though Jesus was younger than John, what is John telling us here? Jesus existed before him. Jesus is the eternal God. John is witnessing to that. He's pointing people towards him. Now, people come, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they ask John questions about who he is. In verse 25, they're asking John the Baptist, they ask him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. So they're, they're asking him, if you aren't the Messiah, if you aren't Elijah, if you aren't the prophet, the prophet most often um, refers to the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 where Moses says, God's going to raise up a prophet like me from among you. They're saying, you're not any of these three people. Who are you? And John says, I'm just somebody who's baptizing with water, but there's somebody coming after me who you don't know, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. John is saying, there's one who's coming who is so glorious, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. And then, and then what happens? Then John sees Jesus in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what the herald does. He says, here he is, guys. Look, there's the Lamb of God. And what has he done? He's come to take away the sin of the world. This is the testimony of the witness, the forerunner. And John testifies more. Verse 32, John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. John says, this is the sign that God told me I would see when I saw the Messiah. And John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan, and what happens? The Spirit comes upon him like a dove. John is testifying, this is him. Verse 34, I've seen and testified, this is is the Son of God. So this is the purpose of John the Baptist's ministry, is to prepare the way and point toward the light. The third character in the story is the world. Okay, so we have the word, we have the witness, and then we have the world. And what does John tell us about the world? John the Apostle tells us in verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. And so he points out the world did not recognize their own creator. They did not recognize life itself walking in their midst. Their hearts are so darkened that they can't comprehend the light. And he says in verse 12, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of 
God. So he says, he came to his own, his own what? Received him not. So there's many in the world who not only didn't recognize their creator, they didn't receive their savior, but then he says, but those who did receive him. So there are those in the world who receive Jesus Christ as that perfect lamb of God to take away their sins. And how are they, how do they stand out? How are they different from everybody in the world to those who believe in in his name. Throughout the Gospel of John, you're going to see God's children are marked by their faith, by their abject dependence in God. And what we see too is it's not of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but it's of God that they become children of God. This is another theme you're going to see in the Gospel of John, that that God's children are in the world, but they're not of the world. Their origin is a supernatural origin. The fourth character or set of characters that John introduces here is the disciples. He begins to introduce to us the disciples as Jesus calls them and they begin to to follow him. Now, in John's gospel, the very first two disciples who followed Jesus were um, most likely John and Andrew. It says that they were disciples of John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist sees Jesus, he points out Jesus, and then it says two disciples follow Jesus. Jesus, but it only names one of them. It names Andrew. It doesn't name the other one. And this is common. John the Apostle does not name himself throughout his gospel. At the very end, he'll refer to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. But other than that, he doesn't name himself. So most likely, this is Andrew and John. And what does Andrew do? Andrew goes and calls Peter. And um, most likely, John went and got his brother James. So we have these first four apostles. And then Jesus sees Philip, and he calls Philip. And I love the character of Philip. I call Philip the come and see disciple, because what does he do? He goes and gets Nathaniel, and he says, come and see. Come and see Jesus. He, he recognizes the glory of Jesus Christ, and he wants Nathaniel to come and see. Nathaniel is skeptical, but when he comes... Jesus says that he knew him because he saw him when he was under the fig tree. And somehow this supernatural insight just proves the deity of Jesus to Nathanael because he responds in verse 49, Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So as soon as Jesus shows he has supernatural insight into perhaps what Nathanael was thinking, we don't really know. Jesus responded to him, Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And then he said, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, You haven't seen anything yet. There are, you're going to see amazing signs. You're going to see glorious signs signs. And he refers to um, the vision that Jacob had um, when he was sleeping at Bethel with his head on the rock. He saw this vision. And Jesus is saying, you're going to see visions like that. You're going to see amazing signs. And, and what's amazing here is Jesus has supernatural insight, but this isn't even the first sign. The first sign he does is turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. That hasn't happened yet. Jesus is setting the stage, and he's telling them, you haven't seen anything yet. Go ahead and continue reading through the Gospel of John. I'm so excited to share this Gospel with you. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Thank you so much for listening today.